But I would say, you know, in a lot of ways, the kids aren't any different because, it, you know, in, in my area, I'm able to keep the same type of structure, this, the same type of expectations that I've had for 37 years. And yeah, I've made some adjustments. You know, I, I've learned that, you know, the best way to get through to a kid is not to raise your voice in any way. In fact, you know, it, the, the less you raise your voice, I think the more command you have, you know, of a group of kids, even if it's a large group. We are back. Three Cycle Strength, the show for strength and conditioning coaches who are serious about getting better and giving back. My name is Adam Reed, and of course, I am the host of this program. We have an awesome episode today. We already had Gary Schofield on. He was amazing, gave us a lot of great insight. Another founder of the NHSSCA joining us today. But before we get to him, let me remind everybody, if you're new to the channel, you know the deal. Subscribe, hit that like button, comment on the videos, share it with all your friends. Uh, And those of you that have been here since uh, week one, that is nothing new for you. But hey, you know, that's how we grow the channel, so we really appreciate everybody that does so. Uh, With that being said, lots to get to today, so let's jump right into it. Our guest today is the strength and conditioning coach at Ben Davis High School in Indianapolis, Indiana, and of course the co-founder of the NHS SCA. Uh, He has a ton of accolades that we could list off, and I would probably do a poor job of remembering them all. Uh, He's had quite the career. Uh, winning several awards, being featured in a lot of publications, and as a speaker at a ton of different events. But I think the two things that really stand out for me about Coach Vanderbush is, one, his love and passion for helping people is quite evident. And I think anybody who is familiar with, uh, you know, has listened to him speak or read anything that he's written knows that that's really what it comes down to for him. And the other thing is just you know, with a 37 year career closing in on four decades now, uh, how do you not respect that about him and that he has, uh, you know, continued to move the profession forward? Coach Kevin Vanderbush joining us today on Three Cycle Strength. How are things in the Indianapolis area, Coach? Things are going well. I mean, uh, you know, as, as around the country, we're adjusting to the situation we have right now. And, our, you know, our school's in a hybrid type schedule. So, I don't get to see the kids as often as I'd like, um, but I'm getting to see them more than I did in the spring. So, uh, you know, we're doing the best we can with the situation that we've been given. Right on. Yeah, I know that's, I've heard that a lot, you know, just coaches struggling with not being able to see their kids uh, and and trying to figure out the best way to do that. And it's interesting too, because uh, a lot of coaches have talked about how kind of that get ready so that you don't, uh, or stay ready so that you don't have to get ready kind of mentality. Uh, one of the things that sometimes gets left out of the uh, equation is the technology piece. And a lot of coaches have been, you know, more set up to use technology and stay in contact in, in these, I guess, more modern ways than others. Uh, how was that transition for you, coach? I know that you're an, an old school guy. Uh, did you feel like you were ready to kind of take on the year of the virtual? Well, you know, last spring, you know, we kind of saw it coming a couple of days before we were shut down. Sure. So we went through, you know, a pretty extensive uh, demonstration of the type of things we wanted the kids to do on their own at home using things they could find around the house. And that helped tremendously because then there, there you know, wasn't quite the need for as much, you know, video and so forth because they actually got to see it in person. You know, we taped me doing it. So, um, you know, we kind of got around it a little bit. And then uh, I'm also fortunate that I have other coaches that work with me throughout the day that are younger. So sure. the technology piece, you know, regardless of my age, I've got some of the, you know, those guys can help take over some of that. And, you know, as we started the school year, I was glad that we were going to get to see the kids at least, you know, two days because we went through three different schedules over the summer as, as the possible schedules we'd face in the fall. And this is actually the best of the three options. So, uh, you know, at least I'm getting to see, you know, these kids twice a week, you know, every week. And, uh, so, I mean, that, it, that helps tremendously because we can kind of keep in contact, you know, and only go three days where they're not in class. Sure. Absolutely. Well, you know, the, the topic of the day might not lend itself to kind of talking about NHS SCA specific stuff today. And so before we even jump into that, 
I wanted to just kind of take a step back and pause. And, you know, obviously we had Coach Schofield uh, on the show just a few weeks ago, and you know, he made some recommendations for coaches that I should reach out to, and we've kind of got the ball rolling on that, and I'm excited about, you know, some of these conversations to come. Uh, but, you know, obviously your role in um, – getting that off the ground and uh, just how far you guys have come uh, in such a short amount of time is, is incredible. And I know it would probably be difficult for you to capture uh, in, a, in a concise manner just the journey, the wild ride, I guess, that it's been. But, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least ask you uh, about uh, looking back where you all started and how it's kind of taken off and, and where you're at today. Know, just your your thoughts on on what you have accomplished you know as a whole as a profession I know that you would never shine the light on yourself that's just the type of guy that you are but you know what are your thoughts on how far the NHS SCA has come and and what your hopes kind of for the next several years are you know we always felt that there was a need you know for what we're doing you know we we knew that high schools coaches needed to have a network where they could talk to other people who were in the same situation being that the high school coach is in a much different situation than a college coach. I mean, a college coach is trying to transition to high school, almost have to relearn things. Uh, and, and the high school guy is different from, uh, you know, the youth development. I mean, right. it's, it's a specific age that we knew that people wanted to be able to talk with other people at that age to see how they run things. You also have, uh, you know, you're working a lot of times in a classroom setting. So there are adjustments that have to be made for that. Uh, you're working with different type of time frames and you're working with kids. You're working with many times 20 sports, you know, 10 female, 10 male. So there's, there's just things that are specific to the high school age group that we felt like the, the typical strength and conditioning organization, the typical strength and conditioning conference wasn't covering enough detail. You know, I, I would go to previous organizations, national conference, and maybe the only speaker that had to do deal directly with high schools. And, that wouldn't be a draw for the, you know, the PE teacher who's in the weight room, the sport coach who's in the weight room, the full-time strength coach at the high school level, because they couldn't really get enough that was specific to them. So, you know, we knew there was a need. Uh, we didn't know, you know, how quickly it would grow. And we're pretty excited about the fact that, you know, it's developed the way it has and uh, people have jumped on board and, you know, we, uh, we hope that it continues to grow with 35,000 high schools throughout the country, uh, all having, pretty much some type of weight program at this point, uh, you know, we feel like, uh, you know, we've only just, just started, you know, and, and we think this will continue. Sure. Well, and along those same lines, you know, Coach Schofield sharing a little bit about the plan as far as, you know, education and certification and, and those sort of things. Uh, I, got, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but, uh, you know, are there uh, specific elements maybe of that or just, you know, other things? Uh, coming down the pipe that you feel like uh, get you most excited or that you're really looking forward to finding out just how far you can take it? Well, you know, I, I, there's definitely a need for a certification that deals directly with what a high school coach needs to know in order to be uh, responsible in the weight room. You know, the some of the other certifications are so broad range that they don't cover a lot of the particulars that a high school coach would need to know. And they're also deeper than what some high school coaches need to know, whereas other ones are, uh, you know, lean more towards personal training or some of the other uh, things that, you know, somebody working strictly with athletes at the high school level, you know, it's not geared to. So, yeah. you know, we're really emphasizing the idea that we're putting, going to put together a certification that speaks to, you know, what is needed for, uh, a coach to show that they have some basic knowledge, basic understanding of what it takes uh, to be effective, you know, to be qualified to, to work in a high school weight room. And, um, you know, what we're hearing is that, you know, people are excited about the possibility of that going on. Now, the thing about that is, I mean, when the three of us sit down or the four of us sat down, it's like, yeah, we need to come up with a certification. It sounds great. And it sounds like something, okay, we can, you know, we can put this together. We, we know but once you start putting it together, you realize how long it's going to take. And it's really taking longer than we would have liked. So, uh, you know, when we do get it going, I, I see that as going to be the next big boost to the organization because uh, people are looking for a way of showing their schools that I have some background, whereas others are looking for maybe some education to help them in terms of this is what I need to know in order to be more effective. So, 
Uh, I think that's the next big thing for us. Um, I, you know, we do have a means of communicating, you know, the Facebook group page, we've got the conferences going and, you know, they're going strong. So, I mean, I think those will, will continue to grow, you know, as we get more and more coaches that, that come to them and see that, hey, there's a lot of learning going on. There's a lot of networking going on and that will, you know, take us, uh, you know, so far also. But I, I just think that, that, you know, certification is our next big bump. You're watching Three Cycle Strength. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell. So, Coach, you know, in preparation for kind of sitting down and having this conversation with you today, I wanted to make sure that, you know, we squeezed as much value out of this time uh, together as I possibly could. And, you know, as a general rule, I try to do that anyway. But, you know, maybe having a, a coach like you with so much experience, uh, you know, spurred me just to take it that one step further. And uh, what I ultimately came down to was if I only had one hour uh, to talk to Kevin Vanderbush, this is the topic that I would want to pick your brain about. And that is the athletes, because what in strength and conditioning could possibly be more important than taking care of the athletes? Uh, you know, we talk a lot about career progression. We talk about philosophy and we talk about sets and reps. But ultimately, you know, my humble opinion, nothing could be more important than actually talking about the kids that you're working with. And so that's what I was hoping to kind of pick your brain about today. You know, you were nice enough to uh, share uh, the slideshow that you used for NatCon with me. And, you know, in going through that, uh, I saw a couple of stories that you had shared with coaches about athletes over the years and what they meant to you. And it kind of stands to reason that a lot of the athletes that get some of the attention, you know, strength coaches like to have them as bullets on their resume, right? I coach so-and-so and he's in the NFL now, or he's in the NBA now. Uh, and that's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm not trashing that, that coaches do that, but it stands to reason that a lot of the athletes that maybe never make a headline, uh, you know, never get the attention that they might deserve are the athletes that have a profound impact on a coach. And so I'm wondering if there are any athletes like that that jump out to you. I know there's probably too many to count. Uh, but over the years, you know, are there stories of athletes that just, you know, they aren't LeBron James, but, man, talk about the impact that they made on you and those around you. It's just immeasurable. Anything like that stick out to you over the years? Well, you know, it's tough to just come up with, with one. You know, when sure. you're working with 500 athletes times 37 years. I mean, that's, that's quite a few that have come through. But, but I would tell you this and, and kind of, you know, along the vein that you're talking, when you first get into to being a strength coach, you think it's about exercise science, you know, and you study everything you can about that. But very quickly, once you get into this profession, you realize it is way beyond that. That is just a minor part of what you do. You know, it's about the relationship. It's about you becoming a mentor, counsel, advisor, uh, the, the, the kind of person that kids can go to in, in all situations. And you start using strength and conditioning as a platform to change lives, to teach life lessons. And when the goal of the day is that, making a difference in the life of a student, you approach it differently because everything you do, you base off of is that, you know, this is my purpose, is what I'm going to do right now going to lead toward that. And, you know, when you have that in mind, you know, this is, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, and you make decisions differently than if it's just about, boy, I want to put the best team I can on the field right now, you know, kind of thing. You know, yeah, I still do that. I want, I want my teams to win. I want the kids to develop athletically. But I feel like there is a greater good with what we do. Being a strength coach, you are there not determining playing time. You're, you're not the person that, that says, okay, you know, you get to go in, you don't get to go in. You're, you're that person that's there to make them better. And when you're there to make them better, you can make them better in way more ways than speed, strength, power, but in, you know, ways and, you know, leadership ways and character development and, you know, being that person that they need. And, you know, I, I teach in a school where kids have a lot of, of difficulties. I mean, we're hundred percent free and reduced lunch and uh, kids struggle with a lot of things. And so being that person that, that can, you, they can come talk to and, uh, you know, just kind of dump what they, you know, they can on anybody else. And then you can give them advice. I mean, I, I'm a big reader. And, and I feel like, you know, when I first started, it was, again, the exercise science. But since then, I've realized that there's so much out there in terms of psychology, in terms of motivation, in terms of communication that makes my toolbox much broader. And I'm much more able to handle the type of things that I get when I deal with kids. You know, I'll, I'll have a kid that'll come up to me and, and you know, I can tell he's down and, uh, you know, what's going on with you? And, you know, the type of kids I work with, it may be something like, 
you know, I just found out my father's not my biological father and, and I was conceived as a result of a rape. I mean, there are things like that that you get on a daily basis working with the type of kids that I, that I work with. So, you know, being able to talk to that kid and, and kind of bring him back up and get him to look at things differently, I mean, I think is crucial. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned in, in my NetCon speech that I mentioned when I'm talking about things is that, you know, I had a son die nine years ago and uh, a lot of former athletes reached out. And the, there was one that really resonated with me was one who said, hey, coach, you're not gonna remember me. And first of all, I'm like, okay, that's not good. But, you know, he says, I'm in a class of 70 students. I'm not a very good athlete and I didn't say very much, but I want to make sure that I let you know how much of an impact you had on my life. He said, the way you role modeled, uh, you know, the way you, you talk with people, the way you did things are the ways that I want to raise my kids. And I use a lot of the, the things I've learned from you to raise my children. Now, to me, that's bigger than a state championship. Absolutely. You know, that's the kind of thing where you feel like uh, the difference you make in lives is, is much more important than those other things. So, you know, I could, I could give you other stories like that. I mean, kids who will write back and say, coach, you know, you were my favorite teacher 25 years ago. You still have an impact on me, you know, those kind of things. And I'm not saying that because, hey, look at me. What I'm saying is this profession and this type of position allows us to be that influential person, in, you know, in the lives of a, a, a kid in the that age group where they're looking for that adult authority figure. Right. They're looking for somebody because, you know, I've got a lot of parents that will come to me and say, I'm glad you're there because they don't want to listen to me now. So I'm glad they have that adult you know, that's going to give them the information that I, they say, I could say it, but they're not going to hear it. If you say it, they're going to listen. So to me, that is the, the major crux of what I do. Um, you know, and when I'm done, you know, I, and I look back on my career and, you know, when you're already 37 years in, it's, it's, you're not too far away from that point. But when I look back, I want to be able to say that, you know, I made a difference in their lives. I was there at a point when they needed me and that the lessons that I gave them helped them to be successful in other ways, you know, not just in the weight room. I'm much, you know, I feel like my job is much more about being significant than just initial success. Sure. Well, it, and a question that I have, uh, because I, I feel like I talk to coaches a lot about, you know, how they can add tools to their toolbox and, and even make their toolbox bigger. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on that, but I wonder uh, how important it is, or maybe even, you know, way more important uh, to just focus on the person that you are as well, right? It's not so much about, and maybe some of that certainly is adding tools, but I mean, you have to be a good person as well. And I'm not expecting you to preach us a sermon here, coach, but I mean, if you're not focusing on a growing and getting better yourself, having, uh, the, the right heart for these kids, you know, truly caring and, and listening and, and checking your own attitude and, and the, that sort of thing, uh, I mean, you're not going to be able to be the person that you need to be. You can have all the communication skills in the world and still be a terrible coach, right? So, uh, you know, I, I wonder what your take is on that as far as the balance between, you know, sharpening coaching skills versus being a, a great person as well and, and trying to focus on, you know, humbly bettering yourself so that you can be there and be the person that those kids really need you to be. You know, I have found, you know, quite a while ago that there's an interconnectedness with um, self-help or working on yourself and working on your relationship at home with whether it's with your wife or with your kids, with learning how to be a better communicator with colleagues, with also learning how to be a better communicator with high school age students. And high school age students can see through people very easily. I mean, they can tell right away if you're sincere or not. And, you know, I, I really think that a lot of what I do has to be that I have to be a role model for them, whether it's staying fit, whether it's how I communicate with people, whether it's being strong in character. I mean, they're going to look to me. You know, if I set rules for the weight room and I don't follow the rules, I, you know, I, I'm teaching kids wrong. But if I say, hey, no food or drink in the room and, you know, I kick, uh, you know, Big Ten coaches out when they walk in with a a water bottle, they know that, hey, this guy, you know, is consistent. It's not about who you are. It's, you know, everybody's treated the same. And there are things like that that I think, you know, are really important that, the, you know, the culture you set for the weight room, uh, you know, has to do with, I think a lot of it is who you are, you know, I, and, and I really think that there are many coaches get caught up in putting certain other coaches on a pedestal and they try to be like them hmm. or try to use what they do and, and so forth. And I, and I think you have to use what your strengths are. 
yeah, I think you have to grow your strengths. And, you know, being an avid reader, you're out there, you know, picking the brain basically of, of everybody that's, you know, has done something out there and, you know, expanding way beyond, you know, coaching and leadership and when, you know, psychology and so forth. Um, but that I think adds, you know, to your toolbox, but it, it's kind of taking you from where you are in a continuum as opposed to making you something different than, you know, who you really are. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, you have to be grounded within, you know, these are my values, you know, this is what I stand for. And this is the best way that I think I can make a difference in the lives of other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And, and really, uh, you know, capturing exactly what I was, what I was trying to, uh, probably failing to, to get across there. So I appreciate that very much. Um, and it brings up another question that I had for you, which is uh, about athletes. You know, I hear all the time from coaches about kids these days. I mean, that's kind of the cliche way of saying it. But just talking about uh, maybe the differences or uh, some of the challenges that some coaches may perceive uh, from a new generation. And you're the type of coach that has seen uh, society and the world, frankly, change over the last several decades. Um, and some things never change, right? And uh, some things like technology have just gone gangbusters and you wouldn't even, you know, if I took my, my iPhone that's laying on the counter here and I walked back into Crawford County, Wisconsin uh, 20 years ago, people would think I was an alien, you know? So, yeah. I mean, it's really, you know, it's been kind of, it, as far as uh, a 37 year career goes, you definitely have had an interesting time to, to be a coach. And so I'm wondering what, what's your take on how kids specifically have or have not changed and maybe some of the challenges that that, that has kind of uh, given you as, as someone who wants to be that good mentor and, and leader for them? Well, I would say, you know, one of the big things that I've seen change is, is really the difference in parents. And, you know, as a result, you see some difference in the kids. Uh, you know, when I first started, I would say that the parent would come to you and assume you were right somewhat, you know, and I want to know what my kids, you know, doing this. Whereas now, you know, if you get a parent that comes to you, they're assuming that their kid has told them the truth, even though, you know, my kid never lies. Well, does he lie to you? You know, you're kind of one of those. You know, so there's a difference in, how, I think, how teachers are viewed. I mean, and I think some of that is the change in society where we haven't really built up, you know, teachers and coaches, but we've, you know, kind of only shown the, the people that mess up. And, you know, we've talked about education in a negative light. So I think that has affected somewhat how, you know, the kids in the last 37 years. But I would say, you know, in a lot of ways, the kids aren't any different because, it, you know, in, in my area, I'm able to keep the same type of structure, this, the same type of expectations that I've had for 37 years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've made some adjustments. You know, I, I've learned that, you know, the best way to get through to a kid is not to raise your voice in any way. In fact, you know, it, the, the less you raise your voice, I think the more command you have, you know, of a group of kids, even if it's a large group. And so, I mean, there's some things that you learn and some tricks along the way. Now, I will say this, that uh, the attention span, I think, has definitely changed. You know, I think, as you mentioned, cell phones and, and that type of thing, where, you know, kids aren't used to listening to any type of instruction for any length of time. So sure. you learn sure. how to piecemeal things, you know. So if you're in the middle of a conditioning workout, you don't stop and talk to them for 10, 15 minutes. Instead, you've got little bullet points, you know, between intervals that you throw at them. And that's, you know much, much better. Now, it's probably always been better, but, you know, you find that, you know, nowadays you definitely have to go that route rather than, you know, thinking that you can keep their attention for an extended period of time, you know, in that type of format. Uh, but, you know, I really think high school age kids are, are high school age kids. You know, when you look back at these things to where they talk about, you know, kids aren't doing this, kids aren't doing that, and then they show you this was 1960, this was 1930, this was 1900. Um, you know, that age group, you know, is always going to be very similar. They're, they're finding themselves, right. you know, they're at that time in life where they think they're adults, uh, but they're not quite yet. They, you know, I use the analogy, you know, that, that sometimes I share with them. It says, you know, life is like a hundred page book. And uh, right now you've only read maybe 15 of the pages. So there's 85 pages that you, you have no idea on. So you're making decisions based on those 15 pages. You know, I've had an opportunity to read more pages than you have. 
you know, so there's some things that I can share with you, you know, that'll help you, you know, get past where you are right now. So you've got to realize you're making decisions with limited information, you know, be able to be coached, be taught by people who have experienced more. And, you know, I think that's true that, you know, if you can get through to them that, you know, there's more out there that, you know, you can reach any of them. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm really glad that you brought up parents and I felt like you were maybe somebody gave you a sneak peek at my notes here uh, because that was another question that I, I was really curious about. And that's, you know, maybe not in the same way uh, as I asked it about athletes, uh, you know, how are parents different? But, you know, I, I feel like they get left out of the conversation, especially at your level far too often because it is such a big part of, of the job, right? Um, as much as a lot of coaches probably fight it and don't want it to be a part of the job, I feel like you're probably doing yourself a disservice if you don't embrace that and figure out, okay, how am I going to get everybody, including them, on the same page and earn trust in them? And, I mean, I I don't know, again, from experience, but I would think that a lot of parents, their heart is in the right place, and they really do just want what's best for their kids. Uh, But I guess I just put it to you simply, Coach, you know, how has that dynamic changed? Or, you know, maybe what are your messages for coaches on in 2020, how to win over the parents? and, you know, get them uh, on the same page as well with everything that uh, you're trying to do for their kids? You know, personally, I feel like the, uh, the sports situation outside of the high school realm has made it much more difficult on us mm-hmm. because when you have AAU club type coaches and so forth that are promising scholarships, uh, because if, if you pay this money to come and, and be a part of our program, we can put you in contact with this or that or, or whatever they get parents that start thinking that sport is about getting a scholarship. You know, it's about, you know, achieving a certain type of success. Whereas, you know, our message is that use sport to learn other things. Hmm. You know, it, it, it teaches you a lot of life lessons at being a part of it. And that even if you don't get playing time, and you know, I have these conversations with kids. Uh, you know, I had a kid last year on the football team, the coach says, Hey, he's getting ready to quit. And, you know, I sat him down and we talked about, you know, why, why are you out here? And, you know, he talked about the reason to quit. He wouldn't get the reps he want. And, you know, I, I went through a whole long story about uh, some other kids that I had seen that had kind of gone through and stuck it out and how successful they became in other areas because they learned how to stick, stick things out and explain to him that, uh, you know, I've been doing this for that many years and I've never had a kid come back to me and say, I wish I hadn't stuck it out. I said, but I haven't, I've had a lot to have. So, you know, you get to have that type of conversation with a kid, but the problem is that these kids are hearing it's about scholarships. It's about making it to the next level. And they think, you know, it, it always, you know, I find it difficult when these kids are at these signings, you know, that they make such a big deal about, yeah. you know, college wise. And then I hear kids saying, I've achieved my ultimate goal. Hmm. And it's kind of like, no, you haven't. You know, this is just a, a step along the way. So, you know, I, I think outside sports have pushed this. I think parents are pushing this. Okay, if I put all that money invested it in, I expect something in return. And, you know, I think parents are also, uh, you know, in the kids' ears in terms of playing time. And, you know, okay, you're never going to get to that level if, you know, coach doesn't play you more. So in our position, we have to kind of change the conversation. You know, we have to make sure that, you know, that athlete is hearing something else you know, that they, they can learn how to push themselves and learn about hard work and learn about, you know, some of these things that are, you know, are indigenous to sport, as opposed to, uh, you know, it's just all about, you know, the next level. It's all about the number of wins. It's all about, you know, those things that, uh, to me are just, you know, a minor part of why you take up sport. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, I know that's not a question specifically about athletes, but, you know, as I I think about what the athlete needs, uh, I can't, really leave that out of the conversation. And I think a lot of times the conversation in strength and conditioning can revolve around, you know, how do coaches need to act um, in order to get the most out of athletes? And, you know, what are the expectations they should be setting for the athletes? Uh, The do's and the don'ts, the programming, all those things kind of fall along that same philosophy. But I guess taking a step back and thinking about you know, what's the structure that we're building around the athlete to, you know, make them successful? You know, if we don't have the sport coach and the parents and the school administration and the teaching staff and everybody all on the same page, uh, what's that, you know, you're, you're forcing that athlete to, to make decisions about, you know, which direction to go in and how, how could they possibly hope to be successful in, in that environment? 
uh, part of that line of thinking brought me to, you know, what what do coaches need to do to hold themselves accountable? You know, what are the, we we ask athletes all the time about the expectation that we have of them, but what are the expectations that they should have of their coaches, in your opinion? Well, you know, the the thing is, you know, I, I have at different times I've worked with, and I work with football quite a bit, sure. but we've done things where uh, Saturdays the kids come in and they talk with me, and they and you know they're free to talk about anything. So we you know, sometimes we talk about coaching and coaching styles. And, you know, they give me an idea of, you know, really which coaches connect with them, you know, and which coaches are, are using, you know, and, and this is where I, you know, you get to have the conversation with kids. Well, do you think you're going to be able to change the coach? If not, you've got to change how you interpret what they're saying. You know, this coach may not be using, you know, the type of, of wording. It may not be using the tone of voice or whatever that you'd like, but you've got to kind of read between that. And, and you know, th that coach speak is a different language. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to show you how to, you know, interpret what they're actually trying to, to get, you know, through to you. Mm. So, I mean, I think that's important. I mean, I, I think that you, you know, you have to, you have to get with kids to make them, you know, understand what coaches are doing, but you also have to get with coaches. I get the unique opportunity that as a strength coach, I get to work with the sport coaches as they come in the weight room. So being, you know, the old guy, you know, when we get younger coaches in, you know, one of the things I love doing is mentoring coaches, you know, where I'm talking to them about some things that I've picked up that I think will help them communicate better with kids. You know, just had a conversation, you know, with our football coach today, we're talking about the importance of every day picking like three to five kids during that, that particular class that we get to and get inside their head, you know, talk to them about what they're doing well, what, you know, the, and so forth, but also starting the conversation off with, I really care about you, or this is what I see that you're capable of doing, which really grabs the attention of a high school age kid. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, I let him know that I see that he can be successful. You know, he looks at you and, and thinks about things in a, in a whole different light. You know, you have that conversation one day, suddenly the next day, you know, he's going out of his way to smile and say hi to you. And, you know, because you've taken the time to let him know what you see his potential is. And, you know, I think coaches, you know, they've got an, an unbelievable ability, you know, to connect with these kids in a way that no other teacher can't. Right. You know, if you're teaching in, the, in you know, math and so forth, you, you can't just get with kids and converse for four or five minutes in the middle of class. But in the weight room, you know, in, as a part of sport, you can do that. And, you know, you can call kids in afterwards. You can you can connect with them in a way that just, uh, you know, if you don't take advantage of it, you know, you're really not, you know, to me in, in coaching for the right reason. Mm hmm. Hey everyone, just a quick reminder that 3 Cycle Strength is stronger with your feedback and input. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at 3 Cycle Strength or shoot us an email at team at 3cyclestrength.com. All right, it's time now for Strength Stories, the stories that forged who we are. That's kind of the tagline for it, Coach. We always like to uh, really be intentional about sharing uh, part of a coach's journey with our audience to one let them know that they're not alone but you know really give a sense for who you are uh, and how you became the coach that you are today uh, and the person that you are today and so i'm wondering if there are any you know watershed moments uh, memories that really stand out from your long career that you could share with us well i would say that you know the biggest thing about you know what i would look at as kind of a hinge moment for me in terms of strength and conditioning was that I took three years off of college uh, to race flat water kayaks. I was on the US national team. I was training for the 1980 Olympics. I was on the 1979 US world championship team, competed in Germany. Uh, you know, I put aside my life in order to, uh, you know, be that athlete that I wanted to be. I mean, I played baseball, basketball, football in high school, but it's kind of like, okay, I want to go for the Olympics. Well, the Olympics were boycotted, you know, in 1980. So I had to look at life differently you know, from a very early time. So what kayaking did for me was a couple of things. One is that by working with Olympic development coaches and, and so forth, and in a sport where, you know, you have to tap into college professors and so forth to learn about energy systems and that type of thing, it taught, it showed me my love for, for training, you know, looking at all the little different things that make a difference in sport. Uh, but it also taught me that it's not just about, you know, the outcome, you know, it's, it's about the things along the way. And what I realized was that what I gained from the training, what I gained from, you know, thinking about things psychologically, the mental approach, the, you know, the learning how to compete and so forth were much more important than me being able to ever someday saying I was an Olympian. 
So it, it greatly affected kind of how I looked at sport and how I looked at training. So with that, it was, you know, I got done with, uh, you know, with that, I went back to school, but when I became the exercise physiology lab rat, you know, it's like I was going to do anything they asked me to do so that I could learn more about that. And, you know, when I saw, you know, back in 19, you know, 84, that, you know, there was a, there were strength coaches, you know, and, and saw that that was a profession. It was like, this is something I'd like to get into. And so, you know, I put on, you know, even though, you know, I was at the high school level where there weren't a whole lot, I put that on my resume that I could be a strength coach, you know, and happened to fall into a situation where, you know, school was bringing in a former college coach who knew that there were strength coaches at the collegiate level. And, you know, I was in the right place at the right time and, you know, probably directed somewhat there. And, you know, so was able to start that. So um, again, that, you know, I've kind of put in a position to where, uh, when I first started off, I had a lot more information than I, I think a, a person typically would have just starting to be a strength coach at the high school level and a perspective, you know, that is different than, than most people would have. So, uh, to me that allowed me to get my foot in the door that allowed me to, once I got my foot in the door to kind of, uh, look at things, you know, from a different angle than most people would have back in the, you know, the early eighties, you know, and, uh, so, you know, I guess that, you know, that's my story in terms of, uh, you know, how I got to be, you know, who I am in terms of where did I get my start. Next segment, and that is tools of the trade. And generally we try and give coaches kind of, a, you know, a, some testimonial, some uh, experience that you've had with products and services that they can take to the bank because it's a coach that they've got a chance to uh, get to know a little bit, but doesn't even really need to be about products and services. You know, put simply, we're just looking for the tools of the trade that you have used over the course of your career that have made you successful, things that you just can't live without. Well, I think that where I see, to me, a lot of strength coaches fall short is the need to use everything they know and to use everything that's trendy out there. And especially when you're working at the high school level. Uh, I like the, you know, the phrase, you know, do less than obsess because I feel like, you know, I have to analyze what I do based on the amount of minutes that I'm going to be working with an athlete. And I've got to look and say, okay, if I've only got 30, 35 minutes a day for five days, what do I need to get done in that time? And if I can simplify to where I'm not constantly teaching and reteaching and using all of these things that I've picked up, but instead making a change with them by doing less and not requiring some of, of the other that I'm, that I'm better off. Just like, uh, you know, social media can be good and bad, but what I see it, it do to a lot of coaches is feel like they've got to put something out there that's different what everybody else is doing. You know, I've got to stand out because, you know, look at this new thing that I've done. Well, if this new thing that you've done doesn't fit with what your goals are for, you know, what you're trying to accomplish, you know, you're not really doing anything. So, uh, you know, for me, I guess my biggest tools are, are, I guess what anybody would call simplicity. You know, the idea that I can do things in a way without having to turn to some of the trends, uh, turn to some of the technology and so forth, and still accomplish, you know, what I feel like is my purpose for being there and for, you know, what that student athlete needs. So, um, you know, I, I have a very simple system. It's, it's, it tends to be repetitive. Um, you know, it includes both strength training and athletic enhancement. I feel like I'm kind of a hybrid of a lot of different things, but it's, it's something that, you know, I've got 37 years worth of data that shows what I can do, you know, on this type of system. And, and you know, so my changes are more tweaks than anything else. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a, a tough thing in terms of, okay, what are your tools? Well, you know, I, I use, a, I am a weight room where it's a, you know, I have standalone type equipment as opposed to multi-station racks because I want to maximize time. And if I want a kid to go from here to there, I don't want to have to set anything up. I don't want to have to change anything. I want them to be able to move a little bit. So, you know, when, when my kids are in my weight room, everything's very structured. There's, there's seven minutes and a countdown timer and they know they have seven minutes to get three sets in. So they know how much rest, you know, they're going to have between sets and they know where they're going to go to next. And so that I can maximize what I get out of a short bit of time that I get to work with those kids. So, uh, you know, my tools, I guess, would be more about structure, more about organization, more about everything being determined ahead of time, as opposed to, 
you know, it's like, you know, Johnny Wooden talks about where he, you know, practice, you know, might be an hour and a half, but he spent three or four hours getting ready for that practice. I feel like I need to make sure that everything is taken care of prior so that when that kid hits that door, that we're going to maximize, uh, you know, the efficiency of the time that, that I have with them. Uh, and, and so in doing so, it's, you know, with me, it's about simplicity. You know, I hear a lot of the same things that you were talking about there in regard to simplicity from coaches about our last segment, which is uh, the importance of nutrition and basically trying to keep things simple for their athletes has yielded the best results. And especially at your level, you know, you aren't going to be able to really get into the weeds too much and you don't have the resources to affect change the way that you, I'm sure, would like to when it comes to nutrition. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind, you know, give coaches out there uh, you, your advice on how that they can really make a positive impact on their athletes when it comes to nutrition. Well, I think, I mean, I think you have to adjust based on your clientele and, you know, I'm in a situation where hundred percent of my kids are free and reduced lunch and breakfast, you know, so they have options based on what the school provides. So my conversation with them is to make better choices from the options that the school provides. And then, you know, we even provide some of them snacks for dinner, but you know, then I talk to them about what they eat outside of, you know, the time that they're with us, you know, the kind of choices that they make. And for my kids, you know, some of it's even, you know, letting them know what healthier choices are in terms of fast food, you know, so, but if I, you know, tried to talk with them about the percentage of carbohydrates and proteins and so forth that they're eating per day, um, you know, it's, it, it's going to be nothing to them. So I have to give them, uh, you know, some, some basics, some things like, okay, make sure you eat within an hour after, you know, you, your practice or, uh, make sure that you're hydrating all day long. Make sure, you, you know, you're bringing a water bottle with you to school. Uh, make sure you don't skip breakfast and explain to them why, you know, breakfast is important. Uh, you know, kids who are trying to put on weight, you know, we're 100% free and reduced lunch, but there's a lot of kids that don't eat breakfast. So find that kid and ask him if he'll pick it up. And so then you've got a snack. You know, you've got extra food that you can eat throughout the day. This is when a good time to eat that would be. You know, so you kind of get with them on their level and, and find out what their circumstances are. I mean, the kids that'll come to me and say either I want to gain weight, I want to lose weight, you know, how do I, I can eat more effectively? You know, I, I ask them, what's your situation at home? You know, is, can you go to mom and say, I want more of this? Or do you have to go within, you know, what mom is serving? What does mom serve? You know, how can you adjust that? So, uh, you know, the idea that for me at the high school level, I could do a blanket nutrition talk, you know, it would go nowhere. So it's got to be based on, you know, give them some general ideas, then work on specifics one-on-one -on -one based on, you know, what their situation is. Well, Coach, we couldn't uh, thank you enough for all the time today. I know that you're a busy guy, so we'll get out of your hair. Uh, if anybody would like to continue the conversation with Coach Vanderbush, you can reach him on his email. That is kevin.vanderbush at wayne.k12.in.usa. Of course, that's up on the screen uh, if you didn't catch all that the first time. And then simply Coach Vanderbush on Twitter. You can follow him there. And, you know, once again, Coach, couldn't do what we do without coaches like you making time for us. And so thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. You're watching Three Cycle Strength. Do you have a great idea for a topic or a guest on the show? Shoot us an email, team at threecyclestrength.com. Man, every single one of these episodes that we put in the books, uh, I feel like I have to add another stop to the trip that we're going to have to take when this uh, whole pandemic thing is over, uh, you know, with all these coaches being uh, so gracious and inviting and welcoming us into, uh, you know, whatever weight room it might be across the country. Uh, I really look forward to that. And who knows, maybe some exclusive video content to come with that as well. Lots of creative ideas uh, churning right now. So we look forward to bringing some of that to you in due time. Uh, for now, let's jump into our last segment, Kilograms. And of course, this is the segment that shines a light on those who are killing it on Instagram. And for this one, since I'm sure everyone is tired of hearing me run my mouth, I'm just going to shut up and let Coach Cal Dietz have the floor for a few seconds here. Of course, this is from his Instagram, at cal.deet. There was a point in time when sports hernias, osteitis pubis, went 
through the roof and the surgeries in sports started to ramp up. You know what it was? It was a year after all the core training books came out to brace the core. So, by bracing the core, you're facilitating the psoas to shut down and the quad to kick in. I never believed in the core training. I don't know why. I, did. I just knew it didn't look right. How would I test it? All right, let's bench press. You do a bar speed bench press or max bench. We're going to bench and then we're going to brace the core, see what happens. Bar slowed down, they got weaker. All right, we're going to run a 40. We're talking three tenths slower when they brace their core when they ran a 40 yard dash. So why the hell would I have them brace their core when they train? I didn't do it. So there you go. Just a, a reminder, of course, not breaking news to a lot of you coaches, but a reminder that the latest and greatest is not always that, right? It, it could be something that's going to end up getting athletes hurt. So just another uh, example of why you got to do your research, why you've got to try things, uh, make sure that you're staying true to those foundational principles before you buy into something. So if you're not already, of course, follow Coach Dietz and make sure you're following us as well uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at 3 Cycle Strength. And you can follow me on Twitter at a Reed Strength. And we really appreciate everybody stopping by today and watching this episode. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure that you're subscribed to our channel on YouTube and turn on those notification settings so you don't miss any of our new releases. I've got a ton of new episodes coming up with guests that I think you guys are really going to like. Uh, you know, from the college level all the way down to the high school level, some really interesting topics and going to be trying some new things as well. So, you know, grow with us and help us get the word out. We would really appreciate it. And until next time, stay humble and stay hungry.